Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U Online Instruction. Welcome to the last lecture of week one. I hope you have looked at these last four lectures, which were taken from an older course. And what I want to do now is sort of sum up what we did this week. And so that Professor Lundstrom can take over in week two and connect it, connect these concepts to the usual thermoelectric theory. Now, the basic idea, if you remember, we are talking about this elastic resistor. That is, we think of electrons going through the channel without exchanging any energy. And the idea is that all the energy exchange happens at the two ends. Now, under these conditions, you can write the current in a relatively simple way. Because you can say that if I consider any energy range DE, I can write down the current as being proportional to F1 minus F2. And there is something here that depends on the density of states, which you could call the conductance function. And if I want the total current, all I have to do is add up all the energies. And adding up basically means this integral. And you also saw in the previous lectures how the same idea was then applied to heat flow, the heat current. And the expressions look much very similar, but then there is this additional term in here, this E minus mu over Q. So these are the expressions for the normal current and the heat current. And from there, one gets these linearized expressions. You see, where current is proportional to voltage difference and temperature difference. And uh, I'll come back in a minute to the important step involved in getting from these current equations, these general current equations to this linearized equations. But what you have seen already is how one gets expressions for each of these four coefficients appearing here. A normal conductance, this GS, GP, and a GQ. And these expressions are summarized on the slide, but I've just put them here so you can take a quick look. You know, this is the average of this conductance function. I guess I'm being a little sloppy here in the sense that I should really be using two different symbols here. In the sense, what I've written here as G of E, that's this conductance function, which depends on energy. What you actually measure is an average over energy, averaged with this DFDE in it. And the same with the rest of it. So I should have really used a slightly different symbol for this, but I think that's not in the notes, but hopefully that won't be a source of confusion. Now these expressions then are what would allow you to connect up to the usual expressions that you are that are normally obtained from the Boltzmann equation. And that you'll be hearing more about from Professor Lundstrom next week. Now, how did we get from this expression to this expression? Well, we used a particular approximation for this F1 minus F2. And I'll come to that in a minute. We'll talk more about it. But let me just say a few more words then about what this conductance function looks like, this G of E. Now, if you had a ballistic conductor, then it would be Q square over H times the number of modes this new concept that I had introduced in the very first lecture. This number of modes, it's like proportional to density of states times velocity, but an equivalent way of thinking about it, and this equivalence isn't obvious, that takes discussion, but the equivalent way is that in 1D it's 1, in 2D it depends on the number of wavelengths, half wavelengths that fit in the width, and 3D it's the number of half wavelengths that fit in the cross section. So that's this M. Now this is what you'd get in a ballistic conductor. In a diffusive conductor, 
you have to, it has to be multiplied by this mean free path divided by L plus a mean free path. Okay. So this would be the expression for the conductance. Okay. Now let me say a few words now about how one goes from the general current expression to this linearized current expression. Now that's what involves this Taylor series expansion. That is, if you think about it, this F1 is like the Fermi function in contact one, which depends on the electrochemical potential in contact one and the temperature in contact one. Similarly, F2 is like the, is the Fermi function in contact two, which is F mu two T two. And what we did is, we said, let's do this Taylor series expansion, assuming that the differences are small. And that is how you get, this becomes like partial of F with respect to mu at equilibrium times mu one minus mu two. And then you take partial of F with respect to temperature and T1 minus T2. So this is of course an approximation that only holds when the applied voltage is small or the applied temperature difference is small. And this was crucial to get from this current expression to the linear response expressions. See, and it is because of that Taylor series expansion that you have these DFDEs. It took some discussion to get from DFD mu or DFDT to DFDE, but that you have possibly seen in the tutorial lectures. Okay. But the important thing is one had to assume a small voltage difference and a small temperature difference. Now the question you might ask is that well in order for this kind of a, a expansion to be valid, the applied voltage must be less than kT. So at room temperature you might say, well, it has to be like 25 millivolts or so. So does that mean our expressions don't hold if you apply 25 millivolts, more than 25 millivolts across a conductor? Now this is where there's this very important point that I want to clarify. And that is when you are taking the expressions we have obtained and applying to a large conductor. Remember, what you have obtained is for a small conductor. But supposing we are applying it to a large conductor, and this actually happens to be a large conductor. Then conceptually, the way you should think about it is as if there's lots of intermediate contacts. Because in a very long conductor, it makes no sense to say that an electron goes from left to right without losing any energy. If you took a big conductor and put, you know, 10 volts across it, an electron couldn't really get through usually without losing energy inside. And so if you're going to apply the, the bottom up theory we talked about, then you have to kind of take that big thing and think of it as little conductors in series with the idea that a, electron in this region, one of these, goes through elastically, but then loses some energy. So it is as if you have a lot of elastic resistors in series. In that case, of course, you could say that in the real conductor, the electron traveling and losing energy are kind of mixed up. And here all we are doing is saying that let's segregate them. Let's say that it goes for a while without losing energy and then loses energy. And again goes for a while without losing energy, loses energy. And then all this theory that we are doing is for one of these little units. It's not for the whole big thing. For the whole big thing, this expression for the current would not be valid because electron would be changing energy. You couldn't just write it as an integral like this. We are really applying it to one of these little things, you see? And then you can understand why this theory tells you that you can't apply any more than 25 millivolts. It is like we are talking about the voltage you drop across one of these little things. So if you had a long conductor with 10 of these little things, then 
25 millivolts across one of them means like 250 millivolts over the whole thing, you see. So how big is one little thing? Well, that's determined by the inelastic length. That is, how far does an electron go before losing energy? So this is the re length, this length is determined by this inelastic length. And in principle, of course, inside it could be scattered many times, as long as not much energy is lost. In other words, it could be losing momentum, but not energy. So with that caveat, of course, you could say that we just did the theory on one of these little things and extracted all this information, see? Now, what makes this tricky is when you do this calculation then, you have to be careful about how you treat this interface because you might have thought that well, I've got this one little thing here, another little thing here, another little thing here. So when you put them all in series, the resistances should just add up. Well, that's not true because the resistance of one little thing is kind of given by a factor of this form. It doesn't go as one over L. It goes as this one over 1 plus L over the mean free path. I guess what I'm writing here is conductance. Conductance goes as 1 divided by this quantity. Resistance is given by this part. So as L tends to 0, the point is there is still a resistance, all of which is associated with the interfaces. So you have an interface here and an interface here. When you analyze this little structure, you'll be calculating a resistance which has these interface resistances in it. And so when you're extracting information about the conductivity of the channel, you have to be, you have to be careful to exclude the interface resistances. Otherwise, you'll get wrong answers. Because this interface, of course, is really not there in the actual structure. We are just analyzing a small inelastic region and when we analyze it, we get a certain conductance which has this property. But from this, I want to deduce what is the conductivity. So let's say I've got this conductance and I want conductivity. So you might say, okay, I know from Ohm's law that conductivity is equal to sigma A over L. So you might say, okay, I know sigma A over L, I'll equate it to that, and from this I'll deduce sigma. Well, that would be wrong, because we analyze this structure, and for that, the correct variation should look like sigma A over L plus MF, the mean free path. And if you include this in your thinking, then of course you'll get the right answer. Then you see this will cancel out, and that tells you that the correct expression for sigma of E would be Q squared over H times M of E times the mean free path. That's it. See? But if you hadn't noticed, if you didn't recognize this fact that small conductors have this interface resistance, then you see you may not have written the mean free path here. You might have written L here, and then you'd have got answers that wouldn't be right at all. But as long as you recognize this, you can extract an expression like this, and that then would actually connect up very nicely with the standard expressions people obtain from Boltzmann equation. And those are things that Professor Lundstrom will be connecting up to next, in his week two lectures. But the Main point I wanted to get across here then, and this would be some an equation that you'll probably see, I think you'll see in his lectures, is that this conductivity, actually by the way, I missed a area, I had this area here, so this should be like the number of modes divided by area. So if you want to obtain conductivity, then you should say it's the quantum of conductance times number of modes per unit area, and then the mean free path times the mean free path. And that would then connect up to the standard expressions. And what is this number of modes? Well, that's what I said earlier. For 1D conductors, it's just one. For 
2D conductors is the number of wavelengths that fits in the cross section, or 2D or 3D. And this gives you a different view of what this conductivity stands for. Okay. Now, this is the expression that you'll see, as I said in week two lectures. One little point I should mention is that in all this discussion, I've generally left out spin. And spin, you see, in general, what happens is these density of states, they always come in pairs for normal non-magnetic conductors. Every time you have an upspin level, there's a downspin level. So if you were anal if you're actually trying to compare with real experiments, the this is what you'd have for one spin, and you have two of them, so the conductivity should actually be twice this. And I didn't include this spin explicitly because I thought, well, at the end you can always put in the spin. Let's do it per spin. In fact, in many conductors, you also have to worry about something called valleys. That is, this expression that we are using kind of assumes that you have electrons obeying a certain energy momentum relation, but actually, usually there are multiple valleys. You have the same energy, you have this energy momentum relation localized at different valleys. And again, conceptually, you can think of these valleys as being conductors in parallel. So, which you could again put in here. So just to give you an example, I said the ballistic conductance is Q square over H for a 1D conductor. What's Q square over H? Well, that's a conductance. In terms of resistance, that's about 25 kilo ohms. Now in conductors, when you actually measure the ballistic conductance, you'll actually get half of that. Why? Because of the two spins. Conductance is twice, resistance is half, you get about 12 kilo ohms. Now you do the same measurement on carbon nanotubes, you'd usually get six kilo ohms, not 12 kilo ohms. Again, because there are two valleys. And so that is another thing that has to be factored into the thinking when you're trying to compare with real conductors. But the message I wanted to leave with you then is that in this viewpoint, the bottom-up viewpoint, where you kind of uh, started from Rolf Landauer, his view of current flow, that where you have an elastic resistor with all the heat dissipation occurring at the ends, this allows you to get a relatively simple expression for the current and also for the heat current. And then by doing this Taylor series expansion, you can get expressions for all the linear response coefficients, which will agree very well with what you normally get from Boltzmann equation. So all this does is gives you a sort of different view of the things. It kind of gives you a natural instinct for where the DF, DE comes from. It gives you a natural instinct for where the Kelvin relation comes from, why GP is equal to TGS, or natural feeling for why Seebeck coefficients and Peltier coefficients are usually connected. And all of these insights come rather easily because of this clean separation between mechanics and thermodynamics. These are kind of two different branches of physics. One is force driven, the other is entropy driven. And what makes transport so complicated is ordinarily they are intertwined. And the Boltzmann equation describes this complicated intertwined process. And one can get some physical insight sort of by specializing to this elastic resistance. It's approximate, but it gets you the right answers, especially in the linear response regime, reasonably close answers. And what it gives you is a lot of physical insight into the meaning of these expressions. And you'll hear more about this then from Professor Lundstrom next week. Thank you.